You want to know how to negotiate with a prostitute? And what I mean is the price gouging stores that are charging more than they're supposed to for their bottles? Well, stay tuned, because I'm going to give you all my secret tips. So in the intro, I referred to the price gouging stores as prostitutes. Let me explain what I mean. I always encourage the Bourbon Real Talk family to form relationships with their local liquor store. You're gonna go in, you're gonna share samples, you're gonna be kind, you're gonna be interested, you're gonna be interesting. And over time, you're gonna get to know each other and they're gonna learn that you care about their business objectives, that you drink whiskey and you don't flip it, and you're gonna be able to purchase bottles. Now, the converse of that type of mutually symbiotic business relationship is a situation where you go into a store and you go, hey, I wanna form a relationship with you. And they go, no, only if you pay me. If you give me enough money, I'll sell myself out. That's how I look at price gouging stores. And I think that's why serious whiskey collectors get upset when they go into a store that's turned themselves into a museum. You can walk in there and all of the bottles that you've ever wanted to buy are sitting right there on the shelves. But there's a reason why they're sitting right there on the shelves. And they're sitting right there on the shelves because they're charging, in some cases, 20 times more than they're supposed to be charging based on the manufacturer's suggested retail price. That's what a price gouging store is. So I remember like yesterday, Wes, our producer, he reached out to me and he was very excited. And he said, Randy, I found all the rare and allocated items. And I said, hold the phone, Wes. You're at Liquor Depot. And he said, how did you know that? And I said, there's only one local, local liquor store that has all of the bottles available and it's Liquor Depot because they're charging 15, 20 times more than they're supposed to for those bottles. And most of those bottles you can have shipped to your house the next day for less money if you're willing to buy on the secondary. He said, oh. But there are ways that you can negotiate with these price gouging stores. And there are ways that you can build relationships with them. Because let's keep in mind, their urge to charge far more for the bottle than they're supposed to is sometimes just out of selfishness and a lack of willingness to put in the work to figure out who the best customers are and to try and use those bottles to build relationships. But sometimes it's just a defense mechanism, right? Because they don't wanna make any mistakes and they don't wanna upset any other regular customers who are the ones that really pay the bills around there. And so they go, well, the easiest thing to do is just to mark it up beyond a price that anybody would reasonably pay and now I don't have to worry about it. And if that's the situation that with the store, there is an opportunity for you to go in there, break down their defenses, and end up with the bottle of your dreams. And here's how. Now, in other episodes, I've explained to you that the way that you build relationships with any store is whenever you come in, you always buy something, you have a friendly conversation, you talk about you know, your whiskey club, you, talk, you know, bottle samples, you offer them samples, you show them pictures of your open bottles, show them pictures of bottle shares, all of that stuff. And you make yourself known, you consistently go in there, and that's how you form that relationship that they want to reward with the good bottles. Now, we're gonna come up with a different variation of that plan specifically for price gouging stores. So the first thing that I want you to do is avoid asking about the allocated bottles when you first come into the store, okay? When you walk in and you see all of the bottles that you've ever wanted, the Pappy Van Winkles and the Blanton's Golden straight from the barrel and the uh, B-Tax and the, there's no reason for you to ask about those bottles because all it does is start the relationship off on a negative foot. So if you walk in, you see all those bottles, I wouldn't even say anything about it, right? Now you know who you're dealing with, you're dealing with a price gouger. So I would say that you wait to even say anything to them about those bottles until you're confident that they remember who you are from previous visits. So if you're gonna try and do this strategy, this needs to be a store that you can very easily frequent, someplace that's on your way to and from work, someplace that's close to your house or something like that. And whenever you go in, I want you to buy something. I want you to check the rest of their prices and make sure the rest of their prices are in, al are in alignment with what you can get those bottles for someplace else. I wouldn't even try this strategy if their prices were high across the board. 
But you can go in and get your daily drink because you can get your Elijah Craig's, you can get your Maker's Mark, your Woodford's, your Knob Creek's, whatever. And while you're in there, strike up those conversations, right? But, but avoid bringing up the allocated bottles in the beginning. After you've been in there enough times that you're pretty confident that they know who you are and you can start to ask about those bottles, when they tell you the price, and this is crucial, I do not want you to have any sort of negative reaction to the price. Most people start you know, complaining that it's far above retail and all of that stuff, and you just put yourself in the category of every other whiskey nerd that goes walking into that place, and that's not good because that's not gonna get you what you want. Here's where you are gonna start to set yourself apart. I want you to start to express to them that you understand why they're doing what they're doing, right? I want you to start telling them stories about podcasts that you've watched or articles that you've read or other store owners that you've talked to and say, I hear it's really hard for you guys to get these bottles, right? Don't, don't you have to like sometimes buy cases of stuff that you don't necessarily have customers for and start to show them that you understand their plight. I want you to take that one step further and specifically I identify with them by saying, you know, it must be really hard for you to have to do all this work to get these bottles. And then you have, you know, customers coming in here expecting you to just sell them to you at MSRP for almost no, no profit when you had to do all of this stuff to get them. And just let them talk, let them explain. Let them tell the story about the wholesaler that came in that was behind on his, his you know, meeting his uh, sales objective. And he put pressure on them that they weren't gonna get their allocated bottles unless they bought X number of cases of some nonsense vodka or whatever it was, right? And they'll start telling you stories. And that's when you can identify with each other. That's when you can understand their situation and they see you as an ally and a friend. If the store will allow you to take photos, I recommend that you take photos of any of the bottles that you're interested in, especially if you can capture the price because that information is gonna become helpful for you later. So you've been going into the store on a regular basis, you're known, you've started to build rapport, you've identified with the store decision maker, and now it's time to start progressing forward towards asking for a favor. So once you have identified your target bottles and hopefully you're able to get photos of them, um, I need you to start doing research on those bottles. And what I want you to do is I want you to identify what their MSRP is, the manufacturer suggested retail price, which for the most part, you can just type in the name of the whiskey and MSRP and it's the first result that comes up on Google. So that's not hard to find. And then the other thing that I want you to do is I want you to do research to see what the secondary value of that bottle is. So if you're gonna play this game, you kind of have to be on some secondary sites and you need to learn how to run comps to find comparable sales. And go look for that bottle and see what other people have been paying for it. And that's gonna give you the lower end and the upper end of what the price should be for that bottle. Uh, then once you have that information, I want you to set a goal for which bottles you want to acquire and at what price. And that price is gonna likely be something between MSRP and the secondary value of that bottle. Um, because part of the reason why the strategy works isn't because you're demanding to pay MSRP, it's because you've shown enough empathy for their situation that when you offer to pay a price that's above MSRP, they feel like you're still identifying with them and that they're still accomplishing their objectives. So you need to pick a number that's somewhere in there. Um, I want you to very specifically start to tell them that you're there to support them for the long term and that you want to be a regular customer of theirs. Okay, And I want you to ask them if they would consider lowering the price for a customer who frequently buys non-allocated items. They already know that's you because you've already come into the store, you know, two, three, four, five times at this point, hadn't said anything about the allocated bottles and always bought something when you were in there and had a pleasant, um, connected type of conversation that's going to make them go, oh, okay, well, if I'm going to give up the value of the higher profit margin on this bottle, it'd probably be good for me to give that value up for this individual because I'm going to make it up on the other purchases that this person will make when they continue to come into the store. So if you specifically make reference to that, that's gonna put them in the right frame of mind to make the right decision. Oh, well, hello there, you fellow bourbon lovers, you. 
I don't know why I'm talking like that. Anyways, I want to invite you over to the bourbonrealtalk.com store today. After the show, go check it out. We've got new merch that's just hit the shop. We've got travel cases for your uh, wee glens and your big glens. We've got toppers for your glens as well. We've got the rocks glasses that we offer now and all the other cool merch that you're used to seeing there. So go check it out after the show and support the channel by checking out our store and picking up a couple things and getting them on your doorstep a few days later. We can't wait for you to check out all the new merch that we've got to offer now at bourbonrealtalk.com. Now, keep in mind, these stores are guessing on prices and are frequently completely unaware of what the secondary value of these bottles actually is. And they often make pricing mistakes. So I've seen scenarios where we've gone into a store and they were asking, say, $800 for a William LaRue Weller that at the time was trading for $1,400, $1,500 on the secondary. And I've seen scenarios where they were asking for $500 for a bottle of Weller 12 that you can have shipped to your door any day of the week for 150 to 250 bucks, right? And so keep in mind, they don't have the data that you have. So now you're in a position to negotiate with authority. And what I do with that is after I've asked them for a discount um, and I, I actually reveal to them what the price is that I want to pay, sometimes they just say yes. Uh, but if they say no and they give pushback, especially if the price that they're asking for is above secondary, then what I'll sometimes do is actually pull up the secondary and show them what those, those bottles are trading for and explain to them that right then and there from their store, you could post a request and have that bottle for less money than they're asking you to pay for it and have it shipped directly to your door. Now, this is a very aggressive tactic, and up to this point, everything that we've done has been about showing empathy and compassion. But keep in mind, we are trying to negotiate with somebody who is trying to take advantage of you, right? And so in this instance, we're gonna use some more aggressive tactics than we ever would at a regular MSRP store because it's warranted under the circumstances. Another thing that I'll do in these stores is they'll frequently say, oh, people come in here and buy these bottles at this price all the time. And they try to make it sound like, no, this is a good deal for you. Usually showing them the secondary stops that argument. But if you are unable to show them the secondary or whatever, another thing that I can do is ask if I can see the bottle. Get your phone out, turn your light on, and turn the bottle until you find the laser code. Most allocated bottles have a laser code, and the first two numbers are the year that the bottle was released in. And it is very common in these museum-like stores for them to have a bottle that's been sitting on the shelves for two, three, four years, sometimes five years. And if they're telling you, and you can actually hold it up and show it to them and say, we well, say people buy these bottles all the time, but this bottle hasn't been released for the last five years, which means this bottle's been sitting here for five years. That's why I'm trying to give you a price that's you know far more than the manufacturer suggested, but not quite as high as what you have it at because obviously people aren't buying it at that price, right? And often that's enough to get them to be a little bit more reasonable about what their expectations are. Now, while you're using all of these mm, slightly more aggressive negotiating tactics, I want you to be polite and friendly. I don't want there to be any arguing. I don't want them to hear frustration in your voice because that's gonna do away with the benefit of the relationship building that you've been working on from the beginning. Now, if you get a positive answer and they say yes and they're willing to discount their price, now it's time for you to offer a bulk buy because there's probably more than one bottle that they're offering. And that's, that's often when I'll go, oh, okay, well, uh, what if I bought three bottles, right? What if we, we, we worked out a deal on these three? Because once they've established in their minds a discount, percentage off of what they were expecting, often they'll apply that discount to multiple bottles and then you get to do a bulk buy and get more than you otherwise would have and take greater advantage of the opportunity. If for whatever reason they say no, and they probably will the first time you ask, I don't want you to get discouraged. And again, don't express any frustration because you don't want to damage the relationship. It's pretty common for them to test the waters and see how strong your resolve is in expecting a discount for those bottles. Um, in, in fact, I've seen scenarios where after you left, uh, they end up calling you and going like, hey, I talked with somebody else and they said I can discount the bottles to X number or whatever. So don't get discouraged. What I want you to do is keep up the relationship building process. So now that you've 
actually broached the subject and they know you want the allocated bottles and you've expressed what your discount percentage is, I want you to come into the store at least two more times after your initial ask. And each time you come into the store, I want you to have a product in hand that you're going to purchase, whether they say yes or no. And then I want you to ask that same decision maker for the same discount again. The second time you do it, it's no different. If they say no, you buy your stuff and you leave. The third time you come in, I want you to go through that exact same process, pick a product, walk up to the counter, and ask for the discount again. And if they say no this time, this is when you're gonna pull out the big guns, right? And what you're gonna to have to explain to them is, I've been coming into your store regularly buying these shelf available products because I know that that's what your store needs to be successful. And I wanted to show you that I was committed to help you getting what it was that you want. But to be honest with you, I can't keep giving my money to a store that doesn't reciprocate. And so I wanna let you know, I know you told me no for the third time, but if you're firm on that no, this is the last time you're going to see me because I'm gonna take my purchasing power someplace else and try and form a relationship that, with somebody who's actually interested in a mutually beneficial relationship. And if they say no after that, just be done with them. They're a waste of time. You're never gonna get anywhere with them. But often you're able to actually get some good bottles for maybe not the best price in the world, but a more reasonable price than what they were asking. And you end up avoiding a lot of the conflicts that you otherwise would have had by telling them how wrong they are. And so everybody's happy. And just as a side note, I know these tactics work because we've used them. Uh, Wes ended up going into that store. They offered us a discount on several bottles. I ended up getting uh, Thomas Handy, a George T. Stagg, and a William Lou Weller for a price that I was comfortable with, even though it was a little bit more than MSRP. So if this is the first time you're tuning in to Bourbon Real Talk, I want to let you know what the show's philosophy is. We are about bringing people together through whiskey. And, you know, we, we've, we've discovered over the years that whiskey has a pretty strong ability to connect people. And connection is something that's important to me because I lost a loved one to suicide in 2014. And as I was looking for ways to help prevent other people from feeling the way that my brother did, I started to notice the connection that I was feeling inside the whiskey community as I got deeper involved into the hobby. And I, I realized that if I started a podcast like this one and I helped you get connected to whiskey, the whiskey would do the rest of the job and get you connected to others. And you could form a whole new network of friends and business associates and people that you knew cared about you so that you didn't have to feel alone, so that you'd know that you were loved. And during that process, I personally had to get more involved in the social media world. And the downside of social media is the anonymity that that computer screen provides to individuals. And sometimes people say things that are not exactly kind to one another, expressing hate online to people that they don't even know. But that got me to thinking, if that person can hate you and they don't really know you, it's just as easy for me to love you, even though I don't really know you. And that's why I end every podcast the same way, and that's this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. I'll see you next time on Bourbon Mill Talk. Oh, I'm just stretching my old ass back. It hurts all the time. Okay, good. Not counting my age. <clears throat> I hurt myself sleeping last week. I can lift a truck, um, but sometimes I wake up injured. So, which is why I encourage all of you out there. Go ahead and work out, even though you hurt yourself. Because once you're over 40, you're just in pain all the time. You might as well look good while you're doing it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Let's do this.